Professor Corey Cropper is an associate professor of French studies at Brigham Young University and his recently published book, Playing at Monarchy, Sport as Metaphor in 19th Century France, from the University of Nebraska Press, explores the way sports and games are metaphorically used to defend and subvert, to praise and mock both class and political power structures. Professor Cropper's research interests include uh, 19th century literature, political criticism, and French sports and games. He's the author of several articles published in 19th century French studies, the French Review, and French literature series. Professor Cropper received a BA from Brigham Young University and an MA and PhD from the University of Illinois. Uh, I also have to mention, uh, just a plug for his blog, he's a, he's a sports, has a sports blog, um, the Sports Academic. Dot com. Uh, so uh, encourage you to uh, take a look at that uh, to see his musings and uh, kind of keep up on um, some of some interesting uh, ideas and, and threads and discussions that are ongoing. As I mentioned, uh, this is part of our ongoing sports and European culture lecture series. Professor Scott Springer, who uh, coincidentally is in Europe right now, uh, helped to put together that series, and uh, we're very pleased that Professor Cropper. Uh, would uh, be willing to be part of that. He's already participated as a presenter for uh, a teacher workshop which was held in Salt Lake in uh, October. Again, topic of today's lecture, the, Euro the Olympic Games, European Elitism for the Masses. Please join me in welcoming Professor Corey L. Cropper. Well, thanks, uh, Corey, and I want to thank Drew also from the Kennedy Center for uh, setting things up and inviting me to speak. And uh, Scott Springer, as you mentioned, is the director of the European Studies Program, and he and I uh, started talking about this with Corey uh, some time ago. And we, uh, we decided that we would speak about the three, uh, the three most mediatized sporting events in the world, that those three would be the, uh, s the focus of this lecture series. And I think you can guess by the topic of, of choice today that the Olympics is one of them. In fact, uh, noticing this table up here, my, my friend suggested that we should have judges sit up here and judge every, all of my, my paragraphs, give me ratings since it's an Olympic uh, uh, talk. Um, but we might have corruption involved, so I think we'll, we'll just pass on that. So can you guess what the other two most mediatized sporting events in the world are? If you've been following this, you'll know one of them is uh, the World Cup, but can you guess number three? Anyone but Cameron. <laughs> the number three, is act number three, which will surprise many of you, is uh, the Tour de France, which is the third most mediatized sporting event in the world. And we have a couple of people who will be speaking about this uh, later in the semester, Julie Hartley and uh, Paul Fournel, a French author. Uh, so, Watch for the announcement of, the, of those, of those uh, pre presentations. Um, my question, though, really, uh, in a way, is what, what do these have in common, these three? As, as I thought about this, other than the fact that they're the three most mediatized, I found this other connection between the three. Um, this has nothing to do with my argument, by the way. It's a happy phonetic coincidence, though. Um, the winner of the first Tour de France in 1903 was named Garin. The first president of FIFA, founded in 1904, was named Guérin. And both of those names rhyme with the Olympic founder, Coubertin. So clearly this is a sign. Um, and, but I point out their names just so that you'll notice they're all, they all happen to be French. And this is sort of puzzling. Why these three events, why did they come about uh, in France and at this time? Of course, part of it has to do with the time. Uh, if you heard Mark, Andre Markovitz's lecture, he talked a lot about the fact that any kind of hegemonic sport, a sport that's going to be really popular, had to come into existence around the turn of the century. That's when national sporting identities were being formed. That's when the media started to pay attention to sports, when people had leisure time to start and money to start spending on on uh, watching, consuming sports. And so part of it has to do with the time. I think part of it, though, has to do with the general uh, inclination. France, they still think they're the center of the universe, which is good. Uh, but in, uh, particularly, there was some challenge to this in the late 19th century. 
uh, and they wanted to establish themselves not only as a center of Europe geographically, but also culturally. And let me throw up a few names here. This is uh, FIFA, obviously the organization that organizes the World Cup, Soccer World Cup. Uh, and if you look at the name, it's a sort of, both of these organizations have this composite name, Fédération Internationale de Football Associa Associa Association. It's a federation of associations. And then you have the USFSA, which would become the International Olympic Committee, the IOC, Union de Société Française de Sport Athlétique, so a union of societies. And there's this tendency in France in the late 19th century to group together in this kind of international organization uh, various cultural or sporting groups from around Europe in particular, maybe a precursor to the European Union in sorts, culturally anyway. I think there's, there's one other theory that I have that I'm, I'm still kind of developing, and that is tied in with Auguste Comte's theory of positivism, and he was a, a sociologist in uh, the middle of the 19th century. Positivism, popular, the, the sort of popular version or popular interpretation of positivism is simply that through science and technology uh, we're going to create a better world. In fact, it'll be better than religion because people will have this altruistic uh, desire to help one another and machines, science, an, an advance in knowledge will help uh, make that happen. And if you think about the Olympics, for example, uh, faster, stronger, higher, uh, or the, the Tour de France is maybe a better example of this. The Tour de France uh, originally was uh, more about the bike and the technology of the bike than it was about the man riding the bike. In fact, a lot of times the people on the bike were referred to like machines, with their legs being like pistons. And so uh, the, the, the Tour, I, I, I think, is more about technology. In fact, the newspaper uh, that sponsored the Tour de France originally, it was called L'Auto. Again, it's, it's a machine, right? And uh, so this ties in, I think, with positivism on some levels, and that's the theory I'm still working on. And, but of course, each event came about, if, if there was something that connected them all, there, there certainly are individual reasons for why each event came into uh, being. Uh, the Tour de France, as I mentioned, was designed in part, at least, to sell more newspapers. Uh, and it was from the start a professional endeavor. And you notice the color of the newspaper is yellow. That's why the uh, leader of the Tour de France was, wears a yellow jersey, because of the color of the, of the, of the paper they used to print this uh, newspaper. Uh, and it also was brought about to sell more bikes. Uh, the, uh, the World Cup started in 1930, FIFA started in 1904, the World Cup, uh, the first World Cup is in 1930 in Uruguay, uh, but again organized by a Frenchman. And the reason they started, the, the, the original international matches, soccer matches, were held between, were held in conjunction with the Olympics, but the Olympics continued on this amateur-only course, where the Tour de France was professional from the beginning, and uh, FIFA was becoming professional as well. So. In, in, uh, after a conflict with the IOC, FIFA broke away and started holding their own tournament where they could have professional athletes participate. And so the Olympics is curious because it remains amateur until the 1980s, and even, in the even beyond that, depending on the uh, individual sports association. Um, so the question I want to ask is why did they stay amateur when these other sports were changing? And uh, um, what, let's see, there's Coubertin. And, and what, why, why did Coubertin found the Olympics? What was the motivating principle uh, there? The, the conventional wisdom, so the Tour de France professional, FIFA becomes professional, and you have this kind of holdout of amateur ethos in the Olympics. If you, if you read a lot of books that, that deal with Coubertin, deal with the Olympics, the conventional answer, why did Coubertin found the Olympics, is he wanted revenge because the, the French lost to the Prussians in 1870 and he wanted to train up a new generation of soldiers. Uh, there are a lot of problems with that theory uh, that we could spend the rest of the hour on, but let me just, to sum up, uh, if, you, if you think of the Olympics, if the, if the Olympics were for high school age boys and, and involved military type of drills, you could conclude that it was designed to create stronger Frenchmen to defend France and, and take revenge for the loss 
1870 against the Prussians. But of course it's not that. It's an international event that brings in uh, the best competitors from all different, particularly at the beginning, European countries. And what's more, the, the French government itself, after 1870, started this very kind of program, training uh, in, in the school system, training the students to become, to learn military drills and military skills. And Coubertin hated that. He thought it was going to sap the creativity and energy of France's youth. And what he wanted to do instead was this broad international competition of the, the best of the best. And in fact, let me just put up a quote here. Despite, even this, this cliche persists, despite this quote, which I dug up, you have to, the problem is a lot of these quotes are not in the conventional spots, but this one is, it's in his Mémoire Olympique, and he writes, the perpetual protest directed toward the victor of 1870, in other words, Germany, or Prussia at the time, exasperated me. In reality, what was less French, less chivalrous, than to angrily shake one's fist while remaining seated? I cannot say how often during my adolescence I suffered from this attitude that a false and petty conception of nationalism imposed upon my generation. Even though I grew up in the shadow of Sedan, that's the defeat, that's where uh, the French lost to the Prussians in 1870, I never felt like a conquered soul. The wake-up call of 1878 enlightened me, and the magnificent turning point of 1889 freed me by showing me a new way to conceive of national capacities and the faith in a future different from the past but not unworthy of it. There are few, these dates that he mentions are, are uh, both world's fairs that took place in Paris. And so what was interesting to him was this bring, com, coming together, now of course here is for commercial purposes, but of various countries and this interaction between them, a kind of international, peaceful internationalism. And also I want to point out that he notes this connection to the past that we'll, we'll develop here in a little bit, but is critical to Coubertin's philosophy. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, before, well. Let me let me just prepare for that quote uh, in, in a little bit. The, the, if it wasn't because of 1870, if it wasn't to seek revenge, which a lot of books seem to indicate it was, I think there's just this repeated. Uh, uh, it's become a cliche. What? Why was it? What was he trying to accomplish? And I went and looked at a lot of his writings outside of those limited to sports. And let me, let me just throw out a theory, and I'll show you these quotes, and, we'll, and I'll see if I can convince you that this is, this is true. My theory is that Coubertin restored the Olympics because he was worried that the, the aristocracy in Europe had become weak and was unable to uh, assume power. Now, we're, we're at this point almost 80, 90 plus years away from the revolution. In fact, more than, eight, more than almost a century away from the revolution when the first Olympics take place in uh, Athens in 1896, over a century away. So it seems strange, uh, but in the, late, uh, in the late 19th century in France, in fact, in 1874, during the Third Republic, the monarchical party gains the majority in the National Assembly, and they offer the Count of Chambord the opportunity to return to the throne. Uh, he refuses it because he wants to maintain certain principles of uh, noble dignity and so on that the, that the uh, National Assembly can't accept. But it's a real, uh, th there seems to be a nostalgia for the past that's still present during the Republic. And there's a real attempt on monarchical uh, partisans to return to power. And this whole nostalgia for virtue, for another way of life, and, and so on, is really in the air. You could say that, uh, um, you know, we, we talk about change all the time. They were talking about progress on one hand, but also a certain group was recalcitrant and holding on to ideas, ideals from the past. And Coubertin was one of those. There was a problem, though, as Coubertin saw it. And he wrote in 1897 in an American magazine called Century Magazine, he wrote this in English, the following quote. As I sat in the gallery of the Chamber of Deputies one day, I amused myself by mentally reconstructing a government of the right. So the Chamber of Deputies is like the, uh, uh, that's the French version of our uh, Congress. I imagined that the monarchy had been reestablished and that the Count of Paris, now Philip VII, King of France, had entrusted me the task of forming a ministry, distributing its portfolios among his partisans. To my great surprise, I could not succeed in drawing up a proper list. Everybody can be a minister, of course, which is kind of a telling statement in and of itself. Anybody can do it. Everybody can be a minister, of course, and some of those whom one 
Some of those whom one might choose at random for the office would not fill it worse than many others, provided they were not called upon to deal with situations of exceptional delicacy. But that was not what I was looking for. I was searching for searching the monar monarchical ranks for men with the force of character of Messieurs Dupuy, Spuller, or Burdeau. I could not discover them. Never before had the complete inferiority of the monarchical party in this respect come home to me more forcibly. So for Coubert, Coubertin looked around and he realized we need to do something to create aristocratic men who have the proper force of character to lead the French government. What can we do to do this? And one possible answer would be the Olympics, to create an international sporting event for the elite, to bring France's elite and aristocrats into connection with others uh, uh, from around Europe, and to have a kind of event that would restore their moral fiber and their physical might. Uh, and I would, I would say, I want to add here too, there's a, this other quote, Couretin, it seems, was of the opinion that the Republic was doomed to failure, even though it lasted until the Third Republic, until World War II. And here's a quote that he, from 1902, his Page d'Histoire Contemporaine. He said, One must really be unaware of what is happening outside our borders to not see that the Republic as a dogma has lost most of its devoted followers. A new form of monarchy has been born that meshes better with modern ambitions, better than a Republic. The old dynasties, by adhering to it, have found renewed vigor and agility as the head of the army and the head of industry, today's monarch sees his subjects return to him and restore a large part of both the rights they had taken from his predecessors and the initiatives that they had confiscated and given to their elected representatives. So Coubertin, as late as 1902, clearly saw that there would be a shift back to the monarchy. And um, uh, something I want to point out that, uh, uh, well, let me, let me go on here first. Coubertin saw then the, the transition, this slide is a transition from these sort of political statements he made about the, the weakness of the monarchy, but its possibility for return and sporting events. He wrote, at the height of the Middle Ages, there was a return of the athletic spirit, to the height of the, of the old regime or the nobility. It was called chivalry. This knightly vigil that preceded the festival full of joy and physical activity in which the young knight began his new life is perhaps the activity that has most resembled the Olympic Games in 1500 years. So too, the young Greek spent his last evening, the last evening in solitude and reflection under the marble porticos of the gymnasium of Olympia. Far from the temples and the noise, he too had to be irreproachable, both hereditarily and personally, without flaw in his life or in the lives of his ancestors. He too associated his act with his national religion, pledged his honor before altars, and as a reward received the simple green wreath, a symbol of detachment. So for Coubertin, what he's, this, this quote to me sets up a kind of chain back in time. So we go from the modern Olympics that began one year before he, he, he wrote this in 1896 in Athens. We go back to the Middle Ages and then back to ancient Greece. But it all passes through this old uh, system, the old monarchical system. So for him, this was a form of restoration. Maybe not a political one yet, but a, a form of uh, of restoring the monarchy, at least culturally, and creating this kind of uh, interaction between the elite of nations in Europe. And, the, of course, the aristocracy in Europe has always been international and not national in scope, right? This, the king of France who marries the queen of, well, not queen, I suppose, the prince who marries the princess of Spain or whatever. And, and so this family, and the hereditary is mentioned here in this quote, the heredity, I mean, this idea of family connection and of being hereditarily pure, in other words, from the aristocracy. Uh, so uh, I want to uh, now, if, if we look at what happens after 1896, 1896 for, for in Athens is a triumph for Coubertin. Not very many competitors, but it's the gratin, it's the upper crust of society that participates, that come down to Athens and, and are cheered on, and, and uh, for him it's just the ideal moment. The plan all along though was to hold the 1900 Olympics in Paris in conjunction with the World's Fair, the Exposition Universelle. The commissioner that year of the exposition was Alfred Picard, and here's his photo. Uh, and here's what he said and how he envisioned this exposition. He said, the Exposition Universelle, quote, must show us on the forefront, us France, on the forefront of progress. It must honor the country and the republic. We must appear as the worthy sons of the men of 1789. So his point of reference is the revolution, 1789. 
And what was so important about that is that it showed France changing, progressing, moving forward. And so we have to be worthy heirs of that by our showing ourselves on the forefront of progress. For him, the Olympics and Coubertin's idea was an anachronism. It was looking to the past. He wanted to look forward. We're the new France. But, but Coubertin, again, looked to the past. For him, the best regime ever was the Restoration, 1815 to 1830. He wrote a whole book on it and, and, and explained in there how great they were when the general consensus is it was a, largely a failed regime. It only lasted 15 years. Uh, and here's what uh, Coubertin himself, his response to, uh, to Pica, I think, is, is telling. Let's see. In Athens, the athletes came in contact with the most pure antiquity. Paris must show them old France, in other words, the ancien regime, the, the nobility. The old France with its traditions and its refined surroundings. The masses will have their competitions and the fairs of the expo exposition. In fact, he calls at one point, he says, Picard's plan, it's just a chaotic and vulgar fair. Um, not a good way to win friends and influence people, but he wasn't too concerned about that. Anyway, he said, we'll make, the masses will have their competition. They can do what they want. But we will make games for the elite. And at one point, he actually broke away from the Exposition Universelle, set up his own renegade committee that was going to organize the game separately until some political leaders came and told him to shut it down. Uh, and he participated in the Exposition begrudgingly. But here's what he wanted to do. We'll make games for the elite, elite competitors, not numerous, but including the best champions in the world, elite spectators, aristocrats, diplomats, professors, if only we could be included in those ranks today, uh, generals, members of the Institute. For them, what could be more ravishing, more delightful than a garden party in Dampierre, a night festival in the Rue de Varennes, which is in the very... Uh, Upe, Classy, 7th arrondissement of Paris. A night festival in, in the Rue de Varennes, an excursion to Escrimont, to Bonnel. So he wanted to have these garden parties. This, these, for him, the Olympics was about this exchange of social and cultural capital, and it was more important than winning or losing. Uh, one anecdote that Alan Gutman relates in his book on the Olympics from the 1896 Olympics, I think, illustrates how connected the Olympic Games were to the monar monarchy. There was a runner who was who, from France, who came to the starting line of a sprint and he was wearing white gloves. And when he was asked why he was wearing them, he said, I'm wearing them because I run for the king. Now, there's no king in France but at this time, but it shows the connection between the Olympics and this, this aristocratic uh, culture and society that uh, Coubertin was hoping to propagate. Now, what happened, of course, is uh, the 19, Coubertin lost in 1900, essentially. He lost the argument with Picard. And I, I want to I show this poster, the one on the right. If you look carefully, you'll see that not only uh, were women participating, but also prize money was given. This, you don't see anywhere on here the word Olympics, but this was part of the Olympics in 1900. There were more competitors, maybe, than there have ever been. There were more awards and prize money given uh, than perhaps ever by the, by the organizers. And... Um, for he, he, Coubertin was, was irate. Of course, I, I will point out in, in defense of this poster, Coubertin always thought fencing was kind of above, it was okay to give prize money because only the most elite participated in fencing because they were the only ones who could afford to, to go to the schools to be trained uh, and have the time to devote to that art. Um, now, since Coubertin, after the Olympics in uh, 1900, he made it a point to avoid, well, and then 1904 in St. Louis, which he also did, wasn't too happy with. He made it a point to dissociate the Olympics with World's Fairs. And, uh, he, he, and he maintained this kind of old-school ethos. If you look at the presidents of the International Olympic Committee, the IOC, besides Coubertin, there's a prince, a marquis, a lord. There are all these old-school aristocrats that led that organization for uh, years. This is a, a Greco-Roman wrestle, wrestler from the Beijing Olympics named Ara Abrahamian. He's the one you might remember who uh, lost in a semifinal match. He won, the, he won the bronze medal match. He won the bronze medal. He went to the medal stand, but he was so upset with the way he was, the judging had taken place that he shook hands with the man who won, got his bronze medal, dropped it in the middle of the, of the mat, and stormed off. 
And there, there are often these moments of kind of disconnect. Another example is Usain Bolt. Remember him? Who won the 100, uh, set the re world record, if I remember right. And he goes dancing across the finish line. You remember this? He turns to the cameras, puts his arms out, and is cheering. Uh, Jacques Rogue, who's the current president of the AOC, was uh, later told uh, the press that he thought Bolt should have calmly and coolly gone and shaken hands with his competitors and maintained a certain measure of decorum. The, this kind of conflict exists still in the, in, in, the, in the Olympics because of this Kubertinian ethos of detachment, of, uh, of, of being more interested in the exchange of social capital than in who wins or loses. But obviously today we have professional athletes like Bolt, Abrahamian, and it's a, it, for them, this is about their livelihood. They can't have that kind of detachment. But um, the, the, this is why I called my talk uh, European Elitism for the Masses, because this conflict continues to exist and to plague uh, the Olympics today. And uh, I think I'll stop there. And if we have questions, I'd be happy to talk more about this. Um, and uh, but th that that's basically my theory, and we can we can talk more about it. I have a lot more things to say, but I'll I'll stop. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. I, I'm not sure who who directed it. Daryl, maybe Daryl Mark. Do you know who directed that film? Chariots of Fire. Yes. Yeah. That, this. This. Uh, well. The, this is. This is exactly. I mean, the Olympics tries to have this uh, ethos of elitism and of amateurism, and they maintain that more or less, even though they had problems with it throughout. And, and the Olympics have always been used for political, social, uh, other agendas than what they were maybe intended for. But my point here is that. Even Coubertin had a political agenda. His non-political agenda was, in fact, a political agenda. Um, but yeah, that, that, that film, I think, typifies what I'm talking about. This, on the one hand, you have the... Uh, I'm trying, it's been a long time. I saw this in high school, so it's been a while. But. He's pushing for professional Yeah. Who, would, who wouldn't dare do that, right? And then you have the religious... Isn't there an Irish... Uh, Scotsman, okay. Sorry. Right. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and that, that that film kind of typifies what I'm arguing, which is that the Olympics from the inception have been a vector for political uh, and cultural debate. So, yeah, but it is a great film to illustrate this this kind of elitism. About tensions within professional sports, say, in the United States, between a, a more an inclination towards detachment, playing for love of the game, mm -hmm. it's not about the money, it's the team that you stay with, versus the migration of players for money, that kind of stuff. Don't you also see a kind of opposition that's still at play within professional sports? Yeah, I think, uh, and we hold sports to a different S as viewers of it, we hold sports to a higher standard maybe because of this past, because of this kind of myth of amateur and doing it for the love of the game and of detachment. Um, but if we think of, let's take the Salt Lake uh, Olympics, right, in, in uh, the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake when there was a bribery scandal. People were scandalized, and, and they should have been, I think, scandalized by that. But imagine that two companies had been if we, instead of we think of the Salt Lake Organizing Committee and the International Olympic Committee, uh, if we think of those as two companies, the fact that there would be money exchanged and favors exchanged, we, that's business. You know? But we, we hold sports to a higher Coubertinian ideal, perhaps, uh, than we should. If, if we think of some of these athletes like R.I. Abrahamian as a corporation, he's looking out for his own interest and he's a professional. Could he be a hero for the working class, <laughs> a hero for the, the uh, professional athlete in a way that he stood up to the system that he thought was unfair? Um, 
yeah, sports, I think sports, for whatever reason, have maintained this kind of detached ethos, even in the era of professionalism. And that's why fans tend to express disgust when they find out about doping. About, But maybe we shouldn't be so upset about that or so surprised by it. Yeah. Yeah, it, you could certainly make the argument that it's the it's the IOC, and I think Rogue actually has done a fair job of trying to change the uh, the ethical uh, workings of the IOC. You know, um, but but a lot of this problem stems back to the original Kuratinian ethos of detachment, and we're we're above this. So they didn't even acknowledge doping was going on until uh, till well after it was well known. I mean, the, the idea. I, I, there's almost a kind of bar head buried in the sand mentality there was, particularly under the Samarok uh, regime uh, in the IOC, and that's that's when things went down in Salt Lake too. It was under his watch. So I'm, I'm hopeful that the Olympic, uh, the International Olympic Committee can uh, improve. Absolutely, yeah, I would agree. Other questions. Yes, sir. Now, do, you, do you think that the Olympic Games will ever kind of get back to that? Do you feel that the Olympic Games will be able to return to that amateurism? Like, um, for instance, in, in baseball, the, you know, the professional athletes in the MLB are not allowed to play in the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. um, but, for instance, you have the NBA, who, who does. Yeah. And so do you think it's just going to keep growing to where more professional athletes are going to be in the Olympic Games, or do you think that they'll be able to kind of go back and, and push, kind of like baseball has created the, the World Baseball Classic, Yeah. and so it's separate from the Olympic Games. Um, do you think it'll kind of go back to the amateurism, or, or uh, do you think it'll kind of keep going and make it more professional? Well, the, that decision, by the way, of Major League Baseball, uh, that's during the baseball season, which is probably why the association decided uh, they didn't want to disrupt the Major League Baseball season, so that's why they decided to go with amateurs. And each sport makes its own determination as it stands now. So there are some sports where it remains an amateur uh, event. Uh, and then other sports, of course, you mentioned basketball, which is obviously professional. And um, I don't know that you can put the uh, genie back in the bottle. You know, it, and you could argue that the IOC has done things backwards. They should have allowed professionals in, in 1900 when it was really exclusionary. When, when, when you say amateur only, you cut out. There are certain people that just don't have the means, they don't have the family wealth to be able to train to participate if you cut out professionals. And maybe they should have switched to amateur only in the 80s, but they, they kind of followed the trend of, of commercialization that... And, and now I think we're so far uh, down the commercial road that it's it's going to be impossible to go back. Um, the sponsorship money that pours into the IOC from commercial commercial sponsors is astounding. Um, so I, I don't see it going back. And maybe it, it's okay. I mean, I'm I, I kind of what I don't like. What I, I I'm okay with professionalism in sports. What I don't like is professionalism that's sort of that pretends to be something other than it is. It's, oh, the Olympics, this, this great ideal uh, of the human spirit. Well, they're out there making money. They're doing their job. You know? And you watch some of these athletes, and you're like, why aren't they more disappointed they lost? Well, it's because this is just one more stop. And the, uh, I remember, remember Bodie Miller, the skier. Everyone was upset because he wasn't more upset when he missed a gate. You know, he's, he's doing a whole professional tour. He's on a circuit, and this is just one more week's race, you know. He's, he's, they do it every week, so. And we're, we're up, so this, this, it's one reason I prefer the NFL to college football. They're at least open about the money that's being exchanged, you know. And uh, I, there's a certain amount of brashness, but at least openness about that. 
other questions? Um, yeah, yeah, actually, I think that you could make that argument. Coubertin, while he's saying, uh, what, is, what is the motto? Uh, is it faster, first, or higher? Faster, higher, stronger, faster, stronger, higher, higher, faster? Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. The, this, this is more about improving the, the individual than about some sort of technological progress. And so I made that argument at the beginning that there was this general tendency toward progress that might link these disparate events. But when you look at the details of it, for, for Coubertin, it's about improving the individual. And for the Tour de France and uh, Desgranges and the sponsors from the beginning, the bike companies that sponsored the event, it was about machines. It was about... And the big event of the first year, of 1903, the first year of the Tour de France, was not the Tour de France. The big event was an automobile race that ended in tragedy, actually. People died and they had to cancel it. And as a backup, or sort of the side note, oh, well, let's, the Tour de France, we'll do bikes since cars have gotten too fast, we're killing ourselves, they aren't safe enough. But we can still look to machines as uh, the future. Yeah, so, I, yeah, that's a good question, good point. Um, did Marxist movements in around Europe during the early portion of the 20th century have any any impact on the elitism or the, of the Olympic Games? Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I didn't mention this, but during the 1900 Olympics, uh, Cooper Town was incensed because his games, his athletes had to participate. They, you know, they break this up into sections at the, at the Exposition Universelle. So, and the, the Olymp some of the Olympic events were put under working class hygiene. <laughs> and so you have this, he's like, what, these are my elite athletes, how dare you put them in with the working class. But I think Coubertin would eventually be influenced by some of this uh, Marxist political philosophy. By the end of his career, by the end of his tenure in the Olympics, he clearly saw that the future of the Olympics was no longer looking to the past. Um, he realized that it was going to be with the working classes, and he made that he made a comment along those lines in his Memoir Olympique. So he, he understood that. Where you see the Marxism a little more, though, is in uh, the Tour de France, because these writers are forced to do superhuman things. I mean, you, you, even today, you look at the, the climbs they go over and the amount of miles they ride; it's insane. And uh, and I think this there were some cities that thought this was. And local governments that passed laws saying you can't ride a bike over uh, 10 kilometers an hour in our city. So the Tour de France had to go around that city. And, and often, in fact, they were called, the riders were called les forçats de la route, the forced laborers or slave laborers of, this, of the road. And so clearly, there's, I think there's, you see that, that conflict play out more uh, in the Tour de France than you do in the Olympics, but it's there. Maybe one more question. Or How do you think you would feel about the Nazi Olympics and Jesse Owens and the Munich Olympics and the slaughter of the Israeli wrestling team? Yeah, those are... The politicalization of the Olympics. Well, uh, I think it's, it's been political from the beginning. Coubertin bought into the 36 Olympics. 36 Olympics is where the uh, torch uh, ceremony was introduced. Um, uh, the 36 Olympics is where the uh, the rings were introduced, it's, and it sort of this is one of my problems with the Olympics and with a lot of sporting events, it, particularly international sporting events, is that they tend to mask other things. They, they detract spectators from the politics that are going on uh, behind the scenes. Uh, you know, Jesse Owens, I think that was that was wonderful. The sad thing is he came back to America, and the Americans saw that as confirmation that our segregation, our system of segregation worked. Here Jesse Owens won, and so our model, our political model is the right one. You know, and it took really until 1960 for that perception to start to change. The Olympics in Rome in 1960 where you have a black athlete carrying the American flag for the first time. So, yeah, I mean, we, we could talk about this. Uh, th these are great topics to, to discuss. and the, the 
I think every Olympics is a little different. Look at the Beijing Olympics. You can make the argument that that was all about commercialization and making uh, China a legitimate business partner for big uh, international corporations, more so than than other Olympics have been. I think you know Atlanta is referred to as the Coca-Cola Olympics, where commercialism becomes blatant. And I, I would say China is the Olympics of of international corporate. Uh, I don't know, takeover is not the word, but 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 a sort of justification of that that kind of uh, business practice. So you go with Carter and boycott the Moscow. You know, I don't know. I, I, I I'm of two minds about the. Bo- I think the boycott is using using the Olympics to further Carter's political. It, it's always, but it's it's always political. It's hard to avoid that situation. I'm not a fan of boycotting. No, I don't think I would necessarily support boycotting. But the IOC may, has made mistakes in picking where it happens. Uh, the author of a book called *The Naked Olympic, Olympics* by uh, his name is Perotet, and I might be mispronouncing his name, but he argues that you should always have the Olympics in the same spot, in some inconsequential little island somewhere, and that way no one can play politics with it. It's just, and that's the way the Olympics were originally. Olympia was apparently. Uh, an inconsequential spot in Greece. That's what, I understand. That's what he argues. So. Okay, thanks very much. I appreciate your questions and your attention.